a typical amateur setup of uh, how to observe the sky, something like this. That's myself with my telescope. I have the 8 inch uh, Dobsonian, which is 200 millimeters big one. And as you can see on this uh, image, it's pretty big, yeah? No, not the biggest one you, you can find, not, not by chance, you will see later. But it's quite convenient and very comfortable. You sit on the chair and then you observe through the eyepiece. And there is also some equipment that you have to have with it. On this night, as you can see, it was quite cloudy. But no matter, even when there are clouds, the moon is so, so powerful that you even through the clouds, you can see something. Again, better than nothing. <laughs> And this was the early days. I just used every night that I could. On a very good night, uh, what you can actually see on the moon, it's uh, something like this. And there are whole maps of the moon where you can explore different um, uh, parts of the moon. In that case, uh, we are looking at something which is 3.9 billion years old. And this, this is the same thing, yeah? This one, this one, this one, this one is just a different magnification. So this whole area, it's like 740 kilometers, something like Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, in, uh, in, in uh, one piece. And here you can, uh, of course, increase the magnification. Uh, this image was shot through my iPhone. So uh, basically what you're seeing here is the same that you would experience if you are looking with your own eyes. But with your own eyes, it's quite spectacular. If you have not seen the moon through a telescope or even binoculars, um, be ready to be amazed. You will see the craters, the shadows, it's just 3D. And actually with your own eyes, when it comes down to the moon, it's even better than uh, what I'm actually uh, showing here. Uh, it, it just feels a lot better. And here is magnification to about, uh, maybe this is 200. Then we go to magnification 400. And this is magnification of about 1,200. In this case, it's called empty magnification because the telescope uh, cannot simply deliver more light, more information than magnification 400. And we'll speak about that later, but it's still impressive that you can magnify so much. <clears throat> now using some methods, uh, you can play around with the dedicated camera and you can actually create a very high resolution uh, photos of the moon. There is uh, a method that uh, we can discuss later, but um, if you have a look at the final result, we can enjoy a really, really nice uh, photo of the moon. I took this one back, I think in October. It was a really nice night, so I was quite lucky. The sky was really clear and it produced this uh, amazing photograph. Again, what you're seeing here is uh, what you can actually observe with your own eyes. If you look through the eyepiece, you will see uh, this kind of a close-up with uh, a nice telescope. And if you do some image processing, clear it up a little bit and uh, enhance it. Again, use the method of combining uh, 1000 pictures into one picture. But, but again, all of this is automatic. There are programs to do it. Within five, 10 minutes is done. Then you can achieve uh, this kind of level of uh, detail. You may be asking, what are the colors here? Uh, the colors are basically, again, amplified uh, colors. Uh, these are probably some iron deposits under the surface of the moon and they show very, very weakly in the image. And then if we use software to enhance those details and amplify it, then we actually see some uh, uh, actual colors. It's one of the most famous craters. It's called the Copernicus Crater. Uh, an Italian astronomer named it after Copernicus. So this one you can actually observe even with binoculars. Not this nice, not in this detail, but you can actually see it. Again, we can focus on some other craters. Uh, this is just an example, not a very famous one, but on that night it was showing nicely, so I just uh, captured it, called the Shikor Crater. Uh, you may not know this, but there are many detailed maps of the moon. And the great thing about the moon is because um, the shadow is shifting every day. If you look at the moon like 15 days a month, one day um, uh, successfully, Every time the image will be different because of where the shadow is falling, then the shadows will be different, the craters that you see will be different. And uh, a little bit ironic, but the worst, uh, and, and it may come as a surprise, but the worst um, uh, time to look at the moon as an astronomer through a telescope is actually full moon. <laughs> 
full moon for an astronomer is very boring. Uh, it has no shadows. It's just one flat over uh, illuminated disk. It actually a little bit hurts the eyes, so it, it's not very comfortable. But any other time of uh, the month, the moon is the moon is really really uh, fun uh, to wa to watch at. And again, there are many detailed maps you can explore. What was this crater? How it was uh, created? Who named it? And so on. Now again, let's have a look at how it actually looks when you look through the eyepiece. Again, this is a video capture. And what you're seeing here is the actual reality. You will see it a little bit brighter when you look at it, maybe a little a bit more brighter, uh, but we uh, lower the brightness and exposure on purpose when capturing through a camera so that you capture the most detail possible because later on you can always uh, increase the brightness uh, through software means and here you can see this is the crater that we saw in a picture uh, before and you may notice it's a little bit wavy and that's the effect of the atmosphere so the quality of the air during the night it matters a lot lot uh, uh, on the final image that uh, you will see and if we increase magnification to 400, we can have a look at uh, <clears throat> the crater itself. The shaking that you're seeing is me positioning the telescope, so uh, it uh, falls again into the into the center. And the movement, again, it's because the Earth is uh, going around, like rotating, and then uh, the whole image is shifting. There are ways to stabilize this. All you have to do is install some motors uh, or some platform with motors on the telescope and then the image stays in the center. But to be honest, <laughs> it, it just feels more romantic this way without any motors, without any of that, without any automation. I have enough com of computers uh, all day at work, so uh, I just enjoy my uh, telescope with the least amount of electronics around it, just me and the sky, and then you move it uh, uh, manually and you don't have to care about anything and there is also something nice into experiencing the actual rotation of the planet itself okay so that was uh, the sun and the moon now let's move to the next uh, area that you can observe this is uh, the two planets that i mentioned jupiter and saturn and here on the left uh, you see jupiter you can actually observe the red uh, spot with uh, the telescope that I have. You can also observe rare occurrences where the planets of the uh, planet Jupiter, they are casting a shadow on the planet. So it's quite interesting. You can actually see uh, the shadows of uh, the moons of Jupiter falling on its surface. Here you see a small animation. Uh, what this means is that uh, Jupiter is actually rotating extremely fast. It takes just 10 hours to make one uh, revolution. And if you do some images during, let's say, a two or three uh, hour period, then you will actually notice this rotation. So you see uh, here I took a picture, then 30 minutes later another one, another, another one. And during two and three hours, uh, if I combine it into a small animation, you can actually see the rotation. Again, this is going back and forward, but if you do, did this for an entire night, it would just go into one direction, completely rotating. Saturn is also a nice target that you can uh, capture. Uh, Saturn is twice uh, farther away than Jupiter, so of course it's not as easy to capture. I managed just once uh, in September, and then in subsequent uh, months and nights it was already too low in the sky, so it was not good. Uh, but another big uh, fan and owner of a telescope uh, that you, some of you know is Michal Vajeka. <laughs> He's right now in the mountains, so he couldn't join. But he was kind enough to share his photos um, of the planets with me as well, so I can share them here. And here is a nice photo of Saturn that he took. In this one you can actually see the divisions in the, um, in the rings. And again, it's pretty close to what you would actually see with your own eyes uh, if you looked uh, through the eyepiece. And he was also lucky to capture Mars in December when it was closest to Earth. Uh, so these are very rare occurrences, like every two years Mars becomes very close to Earth and then you can observe it uh, something like this. And you can even see some hint here of details on the, on the surface. Unfortunately, most of the time Mars is too far away and what you normally see is something more like this. Yeah. <laughs> 
this was back in September when I captured Mars. It was just this small, uh, uh, small globe, and no details could be seen. Yeah, and here in December, it's already uh, much, much uh, nicer and much uh, bigger. And again, here we can see uh, actual video that was used to produce the final image. And if I uh, pause it, yeah, you can see here how you would actually see with your own eyes if you looked uh, through the telescope. Again, it would be a little bit brighter. Here, the brightness is lowered again, so we can capture the most details. And again, I'm here repositioning the telescope so it again falls into the center. Very difficult to do sometimes. And again, here, this is how you would see it. And it would slowly drift away in the sky. Looking at Jupiter, again, this is what you can actually see with your own eyes if you look uh, through a nice enough telescope under... This, this, to be honest, it's under almost ideal conditions. <laughs> Usually we are not so lucky when the conditions in the sky are bad and when Jupiter is too far away, then it's like twice as uh, smaller and it's a little bit more blurry. So. With astronomy, we are dependent a lot on, on the weather. Now that's when it comes down to the solar system. Now it's time to move farther away. Before we do that, uh, a, sh a short reminder, and maybe for some of you who do not know what's a light year, we will use that a lot. Uh, light year is a measure of distance that is used to measure uh, ex extraordinarily high uh, amounts of distance. And as an example, here is the actual how how in reality looks the moon and uh, uh, the earth and the moon most pictures of the earth and the moon are not really scale not realistic but here is a realistic one so you can see the moon is actually very 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 far compared to the size of earth and uh, the moon and this distance the light can cover it in 1.3 seconds the distance to the sun it's like eight minutes and the distance to the closest star Another star like the sun is four light years. And then to some interesting uh, objects like the uh, global cluster, it's 25,000 light years. And to the closest galaxy is 2.5 million light years. So as you can see, these are extremely, extremely big uh, distances. But the good news is that you can observe them with your own eyes from your own backyard, pretty much. Now, what can we observe? Uh, the for one of the first catalogs that was uh, composed of objects that can be observed uh, beyond the solar system was uh, done by Charles Messier. Uh, this was uh, a French astronomer who was actually interested only in hunting down comets, but he kept discovering these uh, other uh, light star like like patches and clouds in the sky. He was bothered with it and he started cataloging them so he, he can avoid them next time so he can focus on his comets. <laughs> So in doing that, actually the most famous and most widely used uh, catalog was uh, invented. It contains 110 celestial objects and it's one of the first things that uh, you will encounter when you start uh, looking at objects beyond the solar system. It's a quite, I would say, a romantic thing, like French guy uh, doing a catalog back in 1730. And of course, it's the most famous and most used catalog uh, in this day. And uh, just to show you that how much we have moved uh, in technology, the telescope that he used had only 16 centimeters of um, aperture. We'll discuss that later. So you can easily buy such a telescope these days, like for maybe $300 and just enjoy the sky the same uh, way Messier did. Of course, back in the day, the sky was a lot more darker, but even so, like, uh, there are no limits. You really don't have to invest thousands of dollars to enjoy what uh, this guy discovered several hundred years ago. And then once you do the Messier catalog, of course, um, there are many, many other objects, a more serious and more science related catalog is called the new general catalog. It actually contains 7,840 uh, 7, objects. With an amateur telescope, you can probably see in parentheses only about 1,000. Uh, but even so, imagine 1,000 objects. Even if you covered two or three per night under good conditions, it's still going to keep you busy for five, six years before you can even look just once 
at everything that is uh, available there. Uh, this one was composed in 1888 by a guy named Dreyer. So it's something that you can all also reference. But these days uh, things are easy. All you have to do is um, go online and see what kind of objects you can see in the sky at the, at the night. You don't have to uh, reference these catalogs. So what kind of uh, objects can you actually see in the sky? Uh, first are so-called open and global clusters. The most famous one is, of course, the Pleiades cluster. And if you look through it through a nice telescope, this is what you will actually see. It's pretty, pretty nice. Maybe here the nebulosity will not be there. This is, uh, of course, uh, with a photo, but still it will be similar. Another interesting thing you can observe all around our galaxy. So this is hundreds uh, or maybe like 50, 60,000 uh, light years. These are global clusters and it's quite interesting. These are groupations of hundreds of thousands of stars into one small uh, area, relatively speaking, small area, like 50, 60 light years. So as you can already see, you can observe quite, quite far outside of our own galaxy. So there are no limits, so to speak. You go further, uh, one of the uh, interesting things I observed uh, this summer was the Dragonfly cluster. So again, with uh, a small telescope, this is uh, easily doable. It's called a Dragonfly because, as you can see, it looks a little bit like a Dragonfly. Here are the eyes <laughs> and here are the wings, so quite interesting. It's a distance of about 8,000 light years. Uh, the, the size of this thing is 46 light years. So again, these are huge, huge, huge things. But in the eyepiece, they, um, they uh, look very, very small. And what we actually do for fun, amateur astronomers, we keep an observation log if we want. We share it online and things like that. So here you can see an example of uh, an observation log that, uh, that I took that night. I actually didn't know that it's called a dragonfly. I just saw something which looked like an airplane. <laughs> and later I saw that it's actually a dragonfly cluster. So interesting things that you can discover. Another uh, interesting objects in the sky are so-called nebulas. Uh, these, are ne uh, these are formed where a star before becoming a white dwarf expels a lot of gas around it and forms these nice areas. Uh, this one is big, like 1.3 uh, light years, and this has been expanding for about 2,000 light years, uh, 2,000 years. It's called the Ring Nebula, so again part of the Messier catalog. We also can name it M57 and distance of about 2,200. I put here two photos because this is the photo of it, and this is quite close to what you will actually see in the telescope. So it's one of the very few objects in the sky that you can actually see some color into it. And I was looking at it this summer and it really looked a little bit uh, like this what, this, what you're seeing here. So quite, quite interesting. Another interesting target, Veil vale Nebula, quite awesome. Again, I was discussing uh, uh, earlier. This is what you actually see. So it's quite interesting, yeah. Uh, and this is the actual photo of it, if you took it uh, through through a camera process. Uh, and it's always also worth always uh, reading a little bit about the story about these objects. In this case, that's a supernova explosion, which happened about uh, 15,000 years ago. And this is the remains. It's basically the remains of a star which exploded and died a long time ago. And the size here is 50, 000 li 50 uh, light years. Uh, what you're seeing here. <clears throat> Another most famous nebula is the Orion Nebula. I'm pretty sure everybody has heard about Orion. And again, this is absolutely awesome when you look at it in the sky. Here's the photo of it with some uh, sensitive cameras and processing. But if you look at it with a nice telescope, this is what you actually see. These are actual drawings of people who look at the eyepiece and spend two, three years drawing exactly what they see. And even with a smaller telescope, I was able to see it from my balcony, at least this part. So it's, it's quite amazing that you are able to observe this even from the city of Brno. So it's not that difficult because it's one of the most uh, famous nebulas, 24 light years in size, 2 million uh, years old. And again, it was formed with star explosions 
and uh, the interesting thing is that the gas and uh, the gas and dust are actually here forming new stars. Like another thing that you can look at is double stars. When you look in the sky, they're actually single, but when you uh, get close by, you can actually see it's double. This is a famous one, and it actually looks like this in the telescope. One is uh, orange, the other is blue. And here you can even actually see a double-double, <laughs> like two double stars next to each other, and that's what you would actually see in the telescope. Then we move even farther than our galaxy. You can actually observe other galaxies. And uh, that's uh, one of the most amazing things, in my opinion, because every time you're looking at it, you're looking at 100 billion stars directly with your own eyes. For example, that's the so-called Sombrero Galaxy. It looks like a small sombrero. It contains 100 billion stars and distance of 29 million years light years so you can imagine here light has traveled 29 million years until you reach earth and finally you were able to see it so in a way in astronomy when we're looking very far we're always seeing in the past so to speak because it's so so distant then we have andromeda you already mentioned this is how you would see it in the in the telescope it's a spiral galaxy and it's moving towards us and one day it will actually collide with uh, the milky way it has 1000 billion stars so it's one trillion stars that you're seeing here with many many worlds more than we can imagine with uh, my telescope you can even go farther you can see 300 million light years away and that's like a whole pack of galaxies <laughs> so here you see these small white clouds they are actual galaxies very 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 far in the distance here you see the person used uh, 8 inch what i have and here the person used 10 inch you can see a little bit brighter the galaxies here and uh, the record that you can see is actually about 10-15% of the entire size of the universe. You can see the quasar, so-called 3C273. It's 2.4 billion light years away. And it's a very interesting object that uh, is a supermassive black hole. Millions to tens of billions of sun masses. And when gas and dust is falling into it, it's just expelling extraordinary amounts of uh, light and energy that is seen very 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 far that's of course a visual representation that's a photograph from hubble and in your telescope <laughs> you would see it just as a small dot but again um, visual astronomy it's a little bit like, like reading a book you're seeing basically the real light that has come out of a black hole from the vicinity of a black hole so this small dot, it's light which has traveled for 2.5 billion light years. I have still not seen it with my own eyes, but I do plan to see it uh, someday when the sky is clear, maybe this summer. And yeah, it's it's amazing what, what you can find there. And again, more examples of how things will look like in the telescope. This is all of it from the Messier telescope. And uh, this is what somebody has uh, has uh, drawn uh, using their hands and their eyes to see it. Uh, for me, my first telescope, I got it last summer, so I still haven't uh, seen many of these objects, but I do plan to observe them. Now, that's the first part of the presentation, the most, uh, I would say, interesting visually. And I'll spend now 15 minutes discussing uh, how to actually choose the right equipment to get you started in this hobby. If you feel like what you have seen uh, is interesting and maybe you want to research uh, on what you can do. 